Hi, Damien Barrett here on Access All Areas, brought to you by OPSM. Coming up today, Carlton star Mark Murphy to join us, as will our resident medical expert, Dr Peter Larkins. The man sitting alongside me today, though, is not Luke Darcy. He's still sunning himself on a five-star vacation in Italy. It's Tiger great Matthew Richardson. And, Matty, great to have you with us. I know you've been poring over the fixture all morning. Have you got the top eight all sorted? Well, I've had a look at it for ten minutes, but I think it's going to go right down to the wire this year. We'll talk more about it later on, but more importantly, Damo, What's going on with Travis Boak? Yeah, a fair bit will play out with the Travis Boak situation today, Matt. He's been in, um, back in Geelong with family and friends for the latter part of, of last week. He's, as we speak, flying back to Adelaide with his uh, Port Adelaide teammates. Meeting scheduled all day today with him. His management's going to get involved. He will get involved with the club. Matty Primus, his coach, wants him to come up with an answer. It won't be coming today. There's going to be two or three weeks at least to play out of this uh, situation just yet. And uh, he's certainly wanting some more time to be bought on this from his point of view before he makes a decision go back to Melbourne and therefore Geelong to play for Geelong or stay at Port Adelaide. That's the only scenario he's got to face. Well, you're all across it. What's going to happen? A yes or no? Is he going or is he staying? If he had to make his mind up right now, he's, I reckon he's gone. Back, back right. to uh, where he came from, Geelong. But uh, he wants some more time just to think it out. But if he had to make a choice right now, I reckon he would leave, be leaving Port Adelaide. Um, Matty, just an issue with the, the weekend's football, part of the split round. What did you make of the scheduling? No games in Melbourne on the Saturday. Only 17,000 people attended the two games, GWS and Gold Coast games, on that day. Yeah. Have we stuffed this up? I think so. I think the biggest issue for me over the weekend, there was not a game on free-to-air television on Saturday or Sunday, and that's not fair to the football public. Not everyone has Foxtel. I think, it, believe it's only about 30% of homes do have Foxtel. That means there's a hell of a lot of people out there not being able to watch the footy on the weekend. That's probably not good enough in my point of view. Yeah, that's uh, four games. Saturday, the two on the Saturday, two on the Sunday, just straight through to, to pay yeah. TV. And just the scheduling of those games on, on the Saturday, the, the GWS game, I was there, 7,500. It didn't look like, to me, there was 7,500. So I reckon that figure itself is in dispute. About 11,000 at the uh, the Gold Coast game against North Melbourne. I think that was the other strange one, that they had Gold Coast and GWS featuring the only two games on the Saturday. Just maybe one on Saturday, one on Sunday. Just, uh, just didn't seem quite right, I don't think. Now, Carlton has been in the news for, for most of the wrong reasons in the past five weeks. Will they make the eight? Because that's why you're looking at this fixture <laughs> before. Well, it's going to go right to the wire, and that's what we want in this season. I think round 23, St Kilda play Carlton and potentially I think the winner of that game could go into the finals. They'll both end up on 12 wins. The big thing for the Saints, though, is that their percentage is far and away greater than the other teams they'll be competing with, which are Richmond and Freo. I don't think Freo will make it. I think their percentage won't be good enough. Richmond are going to be just there also. But I think it's going to come down to percentage in that last game in round 23. So the top seven to stay, as it is right now, with yeah. uh, St Kilda and Carlton in round 23 to determine it, and Richmond and Freo. It's going to be a percentage out. issue, but yep. that St Kilda-Carlton game is going to be like an elimination final in round 23. I think the other seven teams will definitely make it. Something that will help Carlton's cause is if their captain, Chris Judd, uh, regains some form. And it seems strange to be talking about him the way we have in the past fortnight, maybe even longer. Where's he at, Richo? Is, is he still... Does he still demand status amongst the absolute elite right now? Well, if you judged it right now on this season and how it's unfolding, I don't think so. He's not in the top ten players this year. There's no doubt about that. And watching his game on Thursday night, he just seemed to lack the time and ability to get out into space, something that Juddy's always done so much over his career. Is he injured? I think there may be an issue there. I think he really did need the break. He had less game time than nearly every other Carlton player on Thursday night. That smacks of a maybe a sore man. The other thing is that I think Murphy being out of the team's hurt him. Carazzo coming back in will help. And the other thing is Simpson and Scotland have just dropped off a little bit as well. So it's a combination of probably four or five things with Juddy. With Juddy, do, do you worry about the fact he's copped so much hard tagging and, and hard opposition for, for his entire career? Do you fear that we have seen the best of him and that's behind him and, and what's left is just going to be a patch-up? Look, I think he'd be a brave man to write Chris Judd off. He's an absolute champion of the game. But he really does need Mark Murphy back into that team. Early this year when Murphy was getting the tag, Judd was running around without a tag and he was playing some pretty good football. But since Murphy has gone, he's got that tag again and other players have dropped off. It's just taken a little bit of a toll on him. On Thursday, I know you have a look at players and issues. Uh, the whiteboard, you call it, and Chris Judd is the focus of that on afl.com.au Thursday. The whiteboard, Chris Judd, your focus on that.
James Brayshaw, uh, Richo, has copped it like uh, no president's copped it uh, in yep. a long time. This is a Caroline Wilson article from The Age a couple of weeks ago. Brayshaw must be next. The Herald Sun had yet another crack at him on the weekend, uh, liking him to Happy Gilmore, um, Happy Brayshaw. And that was on the flimsiest, to me, the flimsiest of uh, news lines that Michael Warner had managed to find in a very long, supposedly, investigation into why James Brayshaw should not be at North Melbourne. The golf line was that he was seen putting, practising his putting, uh, while a member of parliament was being given a tour of the, the club's facilities. I mean, right. for starters, he wasn't putting. It was an antique uh, seven-iron, so it's fact incorrect anyway. Who cares? Yeah. I, I, don't, I cannot get what is happening to, to James Brayshaw here when it's actually the club itself and the football side of it. Brad Scott and the players, it should have been copying it, not James Brayshaw. Look, it certainly does seem a little bit harsh, definitely, from my point of view, but is there a view going around town that J the problem with Jim is that he's not ringing back uh, these print journalists when they call him and maybe they're getting their back up because of that? Yeah, look, uh, there is that doubt. I mean, but James Brayshaw won't call the uh, people back. He doesn't trust them to, to use the information he gives them. That, that's James saying it. And look, if I was James, I, look, there is an agenda going on here to get rid of him. Um, and it's not really being done successfully because Carolyn Wilson came up with Sam Kekovich as a replacement, uh, honestly. Um, Media, oh, sorry, not media, umpire interpretations, Rich. They yeah. change, maybe not weekly, but they change through periods within a season. What's your bugbear at the moment with that? Well, the biggest thing for me is that they do change week to week, the interpretations. And I have no doubt this weekend the little rule for the week was let's get the ball thrown up a lot quicker. The ruckmen weren't even there at times. Other players were having to contest the ruck. And in the games that I saw, they obviously changed that interpretation from last week. The other one is the rolling scrum that they're worried about. They're, they think it's ugly for the game. Well, there's a simple solution to that for mine. Just blow the whistle quicker and ball the, ball the ball up. They're waiting and waiting and waiting for the ball to come out. Yep. It's not. And they're creating their own problem, in my point of view. The interpretations changing are the issue. There's confusion everywhere on this. Uh, Nick Revolt, one of the game's uh, biggest names yesterday on Channel 7's Game Day, had this to say about the umpire interpretations. Perhaps something that might appease the players and supporters a little bit because umpiring is a part of the game and players make mistakes, umpires make mistakes, everyone makes mistakes. But I think if maybe on a Monday or a Tuesday the umpiring department came out and, and put their hand up and said this decision was wrong, this one was wrong, big moments in games, I, I think that would appease supporters, players, you wouldn't get this constant, you know, antagonistic type messages and, and tweets that players sometimes put up. Nick Revol there, he probably doesn't look at afl.com.au <laughs> as close as he should there, uh, Richard, because it's your call with Wayne Schwoss and Jeff Geish and the umpire's boss every Tuesday, afl.com.au, and it will be explained. Geish has his say, does he? He has his say, oh, explains good. it why. Maybe you could explain a bit more this week because you've got yeah, a few queries there. We'll should. add them to the list for, uh, for Wayne Schwoss's running sheet. Jonathan Patton uh, made his much-awaited debut, Richard. I had knee surgery over the uh, off-season. Have a look at this. This is his first touch, or first yeah. significant touch in footy. Um, what do you make of him? Look, it was exciting to see. I watched this game, obviously, on the weekend. Had a rare day off and enjoyed watching it, and they would have loved what they saw with Jonathan Patton. Only had the five disposals, but took three contested marks in trying conditions, and that was the big thing for me. You saw signs that he's going to be a champion of the future, and obviously Jeremy Cameron as well. Well, it just looks like Cameron and Patton are going to assume those two key forward spots would you say for 12 years I mean I'd have no I could would nearly say that now I'd have no doubt they'll be there for the next 12 years they looked uh, outstanding Cameron is a very very talented footballer and I think they'll be there for a long long time now, now where's that leave Israel Folau who had been filling in for those key forward slots for some of this year until Patton has started and Cameron has come of age just compare them, and, and it may be unfair in Folau's case, but let's just have a look. Jeremy Cameron, similar amount of games. Disposal significantly in Cameron's favour. Marks significantly in Cameron's favour. And goals are just... Uh, it may as well not even mention Israel Folau's one goal there. Where's it leave him? He can't play in the forward line seemingly now. Has he got a role anywhere else in this team? Look, it is... A a bugbear, I guess, that people keep having a go at his rough lab. But you've got to call it as you see it. And there's no doubt at this stage, there's no way they can play three tools in the one team. Three tools rarely works in a team where all players are justifying their selection. And unfortunately, Israel isn't at the moment. So he doesn't play at all? I don't think so. Not with Patton coming into the team. I don't think they can play him. A million I'm... dollar player, getting paid a million dollars to play local football. Yeah, well, that's what it's going to be. And you, you know that people are going to say, oh, Richie, having a go at Israel Flower. I'm not. I'm just simply judging it on form. And with the two talented young players they have, it seems to me impossible that they could put all three in. And, and he can't play any other role in that team? I don't believe he can play key back on the key forwards like a Rewald or a Franklin. And uh, they've got two good ruckmen at the mile. Giles has been great and Dean Brogan's second. So I can't see how they can fit him in. 
Um, the very talented but uh, problem child for Richmond, Daniel Connors, made his uh, comeback on the weekend in this same game we just saw before. Incredible comeback, Richo. He played only three games last year, was disciplined in a very significant way over the off-season and was crucial in what happened out there at Skoda Stadium on the weekend. Three goals in very tough conditions and you'd argue that he was a match winner in, in some respect. Yeah, he was. Look, Daniel, there's no doubt Daniel probably would have been gone from the club if he didn't have a contract. And in November, they gave him the ultimatum that... You know, he needed to go away and have a good think about his sport. His papers were stamped, though, weren't they? Yeah, he wasn't even allowed to train at the club. I think it was for at least a period of uh, six weeks before Christmas. He didn't even attend training at the football club, had to train on his own. He came back after that. He's put his head down. He's gone back to Coburg. He's had a few injury concerns also. Played some good footy at half forward. Got his chance on the weekend and he took it. Super talented. I know Nathan Brown's had a bit to do with him off field. I know yeah. you have too. Yeah. What, what's been the key to him getting back to, to at least playing senior footy? Well, basically, he's just had a few issues in his personal life that he needed to tidy up. He's done that uh, successfully. It's obviously an ongoing thing for him, but he's doing it very well at the moment. Gone back to Coburg, played well at half forward, took his chance on the weekend and hopefully he can stay there. Uh, we don't often talk about behinds or highlight them, but we need to. Uh, Nick Natanui's effort here. Um, take us through it, Richard. Well, I think uh, Timmy Watson in the call summed it up best. This is like a guy playing mini-league football, tapping it to himself and running forward, and he has the ability to do that. We just wish it had it gone through. Yeah. Just an unbelievable athlete that we've never seen the likes of before, Nick Natanui. Did he run too far without uh, bouncing well, it, Richard? In the true <laughs> interpretation of the rule, he probably did, but that was just spectacular. I wish I had gone through like everyone else. <laughs> um, Matty Boyd, uh, the amazing Bulldogs leader, um, had something happen to him after yesterday's win against Port Adelaide. Uh, just watch this and give us your take. Well, yeah, that's just a fan showing a little, a little bit of love, but I think she regretted it. I think Boyd, he's a little bit salty there, and he wasn't happy with it either. I think she had a bit of uh, dry lip syndrome. Who should be more unhappy at that? I think he is, probably, <laughs> <laughs> judging the footage here. Hey, yeah, time now for our OPSM poll question, and you need to head to our AFL Facebook page to register your vote on who is the better player, Gary Ablett Sr. or Gary Ablett Jr.? Give us your view quickly, Richard. Uh, I'll go Sr. just for his brilliance, but Jr. is very consistent. The, the result on that poll can be seen in Friday's edition of Access All Areas. Time now for a break. Next up, Dr Peter Larkins to get an update on the big injury news from the weekend. And now, thanks to OPSM again, it's time for Did You See That? Round 12. When we saw Cameron take a hanger... And Piopolo kicked the impossible. Not to bear. Not possible. There were some clips you may not have seen. Tussling teammates. That's got to hurt a little bit too. Accurate inaccuracy. Oh, it's the top of the post. And baggy briefs. Incredible elastic in those shorts. The top clips you missed from a week of ball flinging fun. This is Did You See That? Clip one. Not far from Addison Stadium is the WA Academy of Performing Arts. Did you see the latest graduates? They're all wrong. They're all wrong. He's, he's like Nicolas Cage. He's got to give that acting away. <laughs> Clip two. To beat Adelaide at home, you need a fine attention to detail. Did you see that the Saints are in town? With a focus in mind, let's show our might. And win tonight, tonight, tonight. To, to yeah, I think we need spell check there tonight. Clip three. Edwards and thought this in. was a goal. That's a point. That's a point. It wasn't. And the ball doesn't sit. Did you see when he thought it again? <laughs> no, it's hit the post. <laughs> it still wasn't. Clip four. Nick Natanui might be a great player. But did you see that he's not necessarily a team player? Nat Nui playing with his own ball in his own team. Look Never. at this. Clip five. Did you see Mitch Robinson's cauliflower ears? Brian Taylor did. Saw the head trainer before the game started, seasoning his ears with a bit of herbs and some garlic and a bit of olive oil. <laughs> Clip six. This Our week, first. Billy Connolly became a giant. But did you see that Sheedy then became a Scot? And no sleeves. And no sleeves. This one. <laughs> <laughs> to vote for your favourite, did you see that moment? And to have the chance to win a pair of Oakley sunglasses valued at $159.95, go to afl.com.au slash did you see that?